Hey, everybody. Good to see you. Thanks for coming out on a chilly night. But spring is in the air. Spring's on the way. Okay, okay John, I'm all yours. Where are we going with this? Oh, okay. Basically, we were going to uh, uh, have you talk about moving medicine forward. Okay. We were hoping that maybe uh, one of the universities or schools was in the Portland area, and we could maybe... Uh, talk to someone that was uh, uh, in the class and could keep us updated on what was going on. Okay. And then we were hoping at the end we could just have some questions and answers. Uh, one of the things that we just found out was you're all over the place. I thought this was just in the U.S., but I found out you're in overseas. You're in a lot of different places. So I think we need to have an education with just what you, what it is that you're doing. So, okay, fair so enough. What I'm doing uh, will probably resonate to everyone when, uh, when uh, I repeat this common rephrase that uh, so many people have at least thought, if not said out loud, why doesn't my doctor know anything about nutrition? And, uh, and it's a serious question because... Uh, the vast majority of patients who come to see their primary care doctor uh, have a small group of diseases largely uh, based from what they're eating. Uh, obesity, type 2 diabetes, clogged arteries, high blood pressure, a host of inflammatory diseases. Uh, you go through medical school to learn the cause of these diseases that require so much time and energy and money from the medical system. And when you say, what's the cause of these diseases? You run into two words uh, that stop all further thought. Etiology unknown. We don't know the cause of clogged arteries. We don't know the cause of type 2 diabetes. We don't know the cause. And it's true. We've not teased out every last little interaction between every gene and every enzyme. Yeah, there's a whole world of discoveries to be made on that level. But to say that we have no idea the cause of these diseases, uh, when the reality is that in the space of my 50-year medical career, we, I've seen this soon. Now, we've become a fast food nation. I remember the first McDonald's going in in Chicago. We've seen this tsunami of obesity sweep through the population. And now we accept as normal that most everybody's fat and uh, they're either overweight or statistically obese, well, getting to be one out of two. And the kids, we no longer, when I, when I went to start med school, we used the term adult onset diabetes because it comes on in adulthood. I haven't heard that term in a while because we're now seeing so many obese children with type 2 diabetes. Uh, and it, it seems the medical establishments wants to look every place else except what their patients are eating. And, and it's really tragic because the science, the science is solid. There, there's no question. Plus my clinical experience, I uh, worked for eight years. I was on the uh, medical staff at True North Health Center down in Santa Rosa, California, about an hour north of San Francisco. And the, the river of American patients would flow through our patient population. And we had a steady stream of people, overweight, diabetic, hypertensive, clogged up and inflamed. But instead of raising their beta blocker dose and their insulin levels, uh, we put them on a, a diet of whole plant foods. A morning was uh, 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 oatmeal with berries and oat milk and uh, nuts and seeds to put on it. Every lunch, every dinner had big colorful salads, hearty vegetable soups, big plates of steamed green and yellow vegetables, and delicious main dishes, curries and chilies and stews and soups and lasagnas and and uh, and and we encourage them to eat all you want because the calorie density is so low. It's, uh, this food is mostly fiber and water, and it doesn't stick to you. And uh, and as a result, we, we saw things on a regular basis. They still do, of course. That I was taught never happened. So before our very eyes, and these patients would come in and they'd stay for two, three, four weeks or longer. It was stunning, the transformation. Within days, the obesity begins to melt away, doesn't instantly disappear, but they start losing about two pounds a day. 
the arteries relax and, and dilate, their high blood pressures come down. With all the water that's in the salads and the soups and the steamed veggie, their, their blood is less viscous. It's more free flowing. So there's a surge of blood through their capillary beds, bringing oxygen in uh, and nutrients to their tissues. Um, the phytonutrients, the plant nutrients and all the green and yellow veggies and the colorful fruits are filled with antioxidants that, that quench free radicals, these molecular terrorists in the, uh, uh, in the bloodstream from all the sugars and fried foods people are eating. Um, uh, uh, when you pull out the animal fats, and it was a completely plant-based diet, when you pull out the animal fats from the diet, you're pulling out the arachidonic acid, which is the main precursor for inflammatory uh, prostaglandin molecules. And now all the fats are coming from plant oils, many of which are in the omega-3 family that are anti-inflammatory. You change the entire inflammatory balance of, the, of all the tissues in the body. You've increased blood flow, you've quenched free radicals, uh, and you've pulled out so many of the damaging molecules. The very act of cooking meat, of, of grilling that burger, of broiling that steak, frying that chicken, oxidizes the cholesterol in the animal muscle. And so every time the person bites into that burger or that chicken breast, they're eating all this oxidized cholesterol. And it's the oxidized cholesterol molecules that burrow into the wall of the artery and set off the plaque formation that leads to heart attacks and strokes. Well, that gets yanked out on a plant-based diet. You've changed everything. Uh, and every organ system benefits, the eyes, the brain, the circulation, the GI system changes. When you change the food stream going through the gut, you change the microbes that live in that gut. Uh, when you're eating meat and dairy, you're fostering the microbes in your gut, in your colon, uh, that drive inflammation. You're fostering the bacteroidetes uh, species uh, that, that, that inflame the gut wall, increase gut permeability, uh, the, get the leaky gut syndrome, um, and drives inflammation throughout the body as well as driving uh, intestinal cancers. Well, you pull out of the meat and now all the, the lovely food masses that are coming down are filled with plant fibers that all have all these wonderful resistant starches from the beans and the peas and the chickpeas and the lentils. And those resistant starches feed the good bacteria, the Prevotella species. And they put out anti-inflammatory uh, uh, molecules uh, that give the chemical message to the gut wall of shh, calm down, everything's okay. And um, and and these and the good Prevotella bacteria put out byproducts that are neurotransmitters. They put out uh, and, uh, serotonin and dopamine, and dopamine and norepinephrine and, and oxytocin, and the feel-good chemicals. And people often notice, gee, I feel better since I've changed to a plant-based diet. When you look, you know, I've had doctors say, so what changes when a person goes from an animal-based food stream to a plant-based food stream? In a word, what changes? Everything changes. You've been you've changed the entire chemical milieu of the of the uh, of the chemistry in the cells and in the extracellular liquids that are flowing there. It, you're a different biochemical creature, and that's going to change. As I said, the microbiome in your gut. That's going to change the the food stream that's coming up into your liver, uh, and it's going to change your liver physiology. Uh, the, the entire body is is switching gears. Uh, biochemically, it's like um, you you had a nice sports car, but instead of putting in high test gasoline, you've been run, putting in diesel fuel, kerosene into it, and you get all this black smoke coming out of the exhaust, and the and the spark plugs foul, and the gas line clogs up, uh, and uh, you get towed into the mechanic, and he, you say, "My car has developed a disease." He says, "What have you been using for fuel?" "Oh, kerosene." He says, I have an idea, try gasoline. And they drain out the kerosene and they clean up your spark plugs and flush the gas line, put in high test gasoline and rum, car runs great. Oh, that, that mechanic's so smart. Mechanic doesn't, isn't smart. He says, put the fuel in the machine that it was designed to run on. And um, 
uh, and it's it's a violation of natural law to to be eating animal flesh. We are plant eating hominids. We have essentially the same digestive system that our gorilla cousins have, and they're up in the trees eating leaves and fruit and vegetables and vegetable material all day. And guess what? They don't develop clogged arteries. They don't develop uh, high blood pressure. They don't develop type two diabetes. They don't develop colon cancer. They die of trauma and infection and parasites from living a gorilla's life, but they don't die of the diseases of civilization that we do. Um, but do we take a lesson from our gorilla professors? No, we eat meat and dairy and oil and sugars and fats and and these, the, this toxic food stream that permeates our tissues and sets off inflammation and clogs our arteries and shuts down blood flow and, and sets off this cascade of pathology that finally you come to the doctor, overweight, hypertensive, clogged up and inflamed, and oh, you've developed some diseases. Um, the clogged atherosclerosis and hypertension and type 2 diabetes. Why did you develop? Oh, you must have bad genes. You must just run in your family. Nonsense. <laughs> uh, my office at True North, I had a plaque on the wall that said, it's the food. It's been the food all along, is the second line. Been the food all along. But ooh, we don't look at that. Boy, people love their burgers. They love that pizza. They love the taste of flesh in their mouth. And, and we're told it's a good thing. And you need protein. And, uh, and you got to raise your kids on meat and dairy. Uh, and look at what we're raising. Look at, the, look at today's children. It's so out of truth. Uh, when, and when we go to a plant-based diet, people get lean and healthy and their arteries open up and high blood pressure comes down. Their insulin receptors clear out. The, uh, their type 2 diabetes goes away. I've, I, I was forced to en encounter a concept no one ever mentioned to me in medical school called disease reversal. I wish someone had told me that Type 2 diabetes is a reversible disease. You can make it go away with a good diet. I wish someone told me that high blood pressure is a reversible disease. No one mentioned that. In fact, the opposite is true. This is lifetime medication. You, no one gets off high blood pressure medication. Type 2 diabetes, the, 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 un, the spoken law was once on insulin, always on insulin. No one gets off insulin. Oh, Yeah. Not only can you get them off, you better get them. You have to get them off. Uh, though their blood, their blood sugar will drop to their boots, and they'll have a hypoglycemic reaction. And so I began seeing, you know, the talk about the elephant in the room that no one wants to mention. It's the food, and uh, and but we've become this fast food nation. You walk into most hospitals, there's a McDonald's in the lobby. Uh, you you look at the trays that come up from dietary the, uh, for the patients, especially those who've just had a heart attack, and and up comes the bacon and eggs the next morning on the breakfast tray. I think the people making up the, the diet plans for those folks are the pathologists down in the in the pathology lab looking for looking for business. <laughs> Not funny though, and uh, and it's really tragic because for just for going to a whole food plant based diet, these diseases are reversible. It's the most stunning transformation in medicine, and yet no one's saying anything to the medical students. And I and I about three or four years ago, I'm thinking somebody should talk to the medical students and tell them this. Uh, so somebody should uh, make it clear that uh, these are foodborne diseases. Uh, somebody should reach the medical students before pharmacosclerosis sets into their brains and they think that uh, that drugs and surgery are the only treatment for diseases. Somebody should tell the medical students that. And after about the fifth time, I'm thinking somebody should tell the medical students about this. So the, the little voice on my shoulder said, how about you, doc? And... Um, and about four years ago, I started going to the nation's medical schools and giving the lecture that I wish someone had given me 50 years ago when I was a first year med student. Uh, and I, my slide presentation is what I wish I learned in medical school about nutrition. Uh, and I've modified it to a, to a second, uh, and that's available on my website. You're all welcome to, uh, to, uh, uh, to view what I'm telling the med students. 
I've modified it to uh, to a little bit more uh, technical for the physicians uh, and med students, uh, and I've turned it into quote mechanisms of disease reversal using plant based nutrition. But it's basically the same message: uh, put the right fuel in the in the organism, and uh, and these diseases go away. A vast majority of them. You know, it depends how much damage has been done in the body, but the vast majority of, of illnesses that make people take these medications um, are, uh, are reversible with a whole food plant-based diet. So I've uh, up and throughout 2018, 19, 2020, I've lived in hotels and airports going to medical schools and uh, spoke at Western College in in Eugene, uh, Western College of uh, Osteopathic Medicine. Actually, I came up to Oregon, and um, and I was uh, plan planning on going to all the med schools in the country. Still are, uh, but along comes COVID, and nobody wants to gather three hundred medical students in an auditorium anymore and and uh, breathe on each other. So uh, I got to uh, adapt to the times. And so I uh, took, um, I, we went uh, online and uh, Zoom appears as we are taking advantage of this evening. And we uh, and began uh, giving these presentations by Zoom. And uh, as uh, John just mentioned, uh, I've not uh, confine my teaching to uh, to North America. I've been up in Canada. I spoke by Zoom at the University of Calgary, at uh, 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 Queen's College in Toronto, at the University of Toronto, um, University of British Columbia hospitals. Um, so I've uh, uh, you know I've been through Canada, but uh, also we took a trip to New Zealand and Australia. And then I've been over to Europe, in Poland, Lithuania, um, because they're all running into the same thing. The, the the medical students in France aren't learning anything about it. In New Zealand, they're not learning anything about it. In Australia, and the Australians are getting fatter, and the New Zealanders are getting obese. And, the, you know, the same disease is, is infiltrating societies around the world. And uh, and billions and billions are being spent to find the cause of this increasing waistline, and it's the food. <laughs> so uh, so uh, that's where moving medicine forward uh, originated from. It's uh, the uh, uh, mechanism by which uh, I've been uh, addressing all these medical schools uh, regarding this basic. Uh, the reality that we need to take into account. Uh, in North America, there's 150 medical schools. So if I can do one a week, uh, 50 weeks in a year, um, within three years, I should hit all 150 of them. So it's not a, an impossible task here. And I keep doing one or two a week. The students are loving this information. Uh, they are so hungry for it, pun intended, I guess. Uh, because um, it's it, uh, easier for me now, because in every medical school class now, there's 20 or 30 students. They've seen forks over knives. They've seen what the health. They've seen conspiracy. The the light is on. They, they know there's something up with nutrition there. But what I'm what I the message that I want to give is this. Look, look, one, understand one. These are reversible diseases. Number two, a plant-based diet is the key to reversing these diseases. And three, um, we need a new model of medicine. Uh, and up until this point, the, the profession of the dietitian has been an afterthought in Western medicine. Uh, so don't bother me. Uh, send a, yeah, send the patient dietitian, should give them a diet, don't bother me. I'm up in the operating room doing real medicine. But what are you doing up in that operating room, doctor? You're dealing with the infections and the infarctions and the amputations from what your patients are eating. You're all dealing with nutrition-based diseases and you do these half million dollar graphs and, and put in new arteries uh, into the patient's heart and then send them out into the world where they eat more spare ribs and burgers and pizzas and clog up their grafts. What, where's the sanity in this? So I said, listen, we got to get to the root of the problem here. Here's the new model. I have a nice slide uh, that I, uh, uh, that I illustrate this with, but I said, look, uh, 
no matter what specialty you go into, family practice, uh, emergency medicine, pediatrics, uh, surgery, uh, orthopedics, urology, doesn't matter. When you open the door of your waiting room, who's sitting there waiting to see you? Mr. and Mrs. America, overweight, diabetic, hypertensive, clogged up and inflamed and you from what they're eating. And uh, I said, so how do you deal with this? The way to deal with it is, first of all, when you see these people in outpatient clinic or in your own medical office, wherever you wind up practicing, uh, um, be a doctor, okay? Practice good medicine, take a good medical history, put them on the exam table, do a good physical exam, order your lab results, uh, order your lab tests, Get the diagnosis, yeah, hypertension, atherosclerosis, diabetes, yeah, 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 get your list there. Um, but before you do, and, and if you need to, give them, start them on medications. But before you give them that prescription and send them out for, and I'll, I'll see you in a month, you lean across and say, um, you know, I'm, I'm confident that we were getting you feel better. But before you leave, I want you to go down to room 121 and there you'll find Miss Wilson, the plant-based dietitian or Mr. Parker, the plant-based dietitian. I want you to sit with them. They're going to talk to you about what to eat. They're going to give you articles. They're going to give you websites to visit. They're going to show you videos. They are going to meet you on Saturday at the supermarket and show you how to shop in a healthy manner. You eat like they tell you to eat and you come back and see me in a month. And let's see if you're not leaner and healthier with better numbers here. And if you need a food coach to call in the middle of the week, we'll, we'll fix you up with one of those two. But it's really important. Every meal matters. And it's delicious food. And we'll work with you with the food you already like. But we need to take you from the food you've been eating that's created all these diseases and get you on a diet of whole plant foods. And let's see what your body does with it. I know what your body's going to do. With it. It's going to get you leaner and healthier is what's going to happen. And I say, I'm, I'm the happiest doctor I know. My, my patients get healthy. And I tell the med students, especially the young ones, when you're a medical student, you're there to learn medicine and, and acquire these powerful tools. And you want to learn how to use uh, diuretics to make edema go away and uh, in the lungs and the legs. You want to learn how to use antibiotics uh, to clear up infections. I tell them, you want to know the most powerful tool of all? You want to reverse these diseases instead of controlling their symptoms? Whole food, plant-based diet. Let's talk about that. And you'll be the happiest doctor you know. And and the med students are delighted to hear this. They it empowers them and it makes them look at their own diets. <laughs> the comments I get back after the lecture that this made me think about my own diet as well as my patients. Good. Then we uh, a doctor who walks into the exam room to meet the patients for the first time with a big pot belly and a pocket full of beta blockers and statins does not set a great example for his patients as far as how to be healthy. The doctor needs to be healthy. And so I encourage them to uh, uh, to look at their own diet. And there's ways to do it. You can do it all at once, you do it gradually. I don't care as long as you get there. And um, so this is like trying to turn an ocean liner, but there's for me, there's nothing else to do with, the, with my medical career at this point. Uh, if I go to my grave with things still as they are, uh, and with the medical model being practiced like it's always been, uh, I consider my medical career a failure. Uh, uh, I want to get plant-based nutrition incorporated into the fabric of, um, of medical education, which is also moving medicine forward is involved in because it's nutrition, especially plant-based nutrition, is so powerful it should be woven into the teaching in all four years of med school. The first year when you're learning basic sciences, anatomy, learn the anatomy of the digestive system. Physiology, learn the, how the digestive system turns food into, uh, into energy uh, and the effect on the microbiome, et cetera. The, my, you learn it in microbiology, how food affects uh, the microbes in your gut there. Uh, and certainly in biochemistry, how, you know, the difference between animal-based foods and plant-based foods, uh, pharmacology, how these different drugs work differently in obese people, normal weight people, uh, people who keep fat in their blood all the time. 
And then when you get to the, to the two clinical years, when the student is rotating through the various clinical um, uh, rotations and you spend uh, three months on pediatrics and three months on uh, uh, internal medicine, three months in surgery and three months obstetrics, in every one of those specialties, how is the patient's diet creating those diseases that brought us here, the, the surgical patient with the diverticulitis, the um, internal medicine patient with the diabetes, the obese child in pediatrics. It's a food. It's the food, and it, and it permeates all of medicine, and it should permeate all of medical education. The German philosopher Goethe said, what you know about, you see. Once you know about something, you start seeing it everywhere. Well, what more important thing can we educate our young doctors to, to see than the effect of their patient's diet? So uh, it's the food, it's the food, it's the food. And that's really what uh, Moving Medicine Forward is about. Uh, uh, beginning of last year, we got our 501c3 designation from the IRS. Thank you, IRS. And so um, people can make tax deductible donations. I'm not here to, to make that pitch, but we, we at least allows me to uh, continue our, my teaching here. And, um, and I'm trying to put myself out of a job. You know, I shouldn't have to be doing this. Uh, this should already be incorporated into the medical education system, but uh, it's where we are uh, right now. And it's, it's my mission at this point. So that's what moving medical, moving medicine forward uh, is about, and how it originated, and uh, our hopes for the future. Uh, we, uh, you know, it's moving at a glacial pace. In in one way, in that I spoke at the University of Washington, in Seattle, and afterwards, a professor of surgery came down, and he said, "Nice talk, doc, but listen, uh, they." Uh, the National Board of Medical Examiners, when, when we when the students take their national board exams, there's no questions about nutrition. Uh, and until the national board starts asking those questions, we're not going to be teaching it. It's enough uh, to get them to learn biochemistry and principles of surgery. There's no room in the curriculum for nutrition yet. And he uh, says, well, you know, talk to the National Board of Medical Examiners and get some questions on nutrition on the board exams. Mm, then we'll start teaching it. So we went to the National Board of Medical Examiners. <laughs> so what do you need? So well, we need questions. We don't know anything about this. So uh, so I'm working with the American College of Lifestyle Medicine and the Plantrician Project to develop a pool of questions to bring to the National Board so they can start using them on, on their board exams. It's they're, they're very reluctant to do this. It, it shakes up their medical model. It shakes up their financial model. They're afraid to open Pandora's box, but they have no choice. Uh, it's it's really important. And finally, uh, and then we'll open it up for questions here. Um, uh, the the key is in the students. Some people say, "How are you? How can you go into these medical schools and deliver this message that is really heretical? It's heresy. Uh, what I'm saying here." Because, as I said, it threatens their intellectual understanding of what these diseases are, etiology unknown. It threatens their treatment model about, you know, the history, physical, prescription, and goodbye. Uh, it, it changes that uh, model. Uh, and it changes it and it upsets their financial model. A lot of stents won't, won't be placed in arteries. A lot of chests won't be opened uh, for bypasses. Uh, the bean counter is going to have to change the way they they sort the beans there. But um, the heck with it. That's uh, not my concern. So how do we get to our audiences? We go right to the students. We just do an end run around administration. I don't want to deal with the guys with the arm folded and the clucking tongues. The, we go right to the students and every in many medical schools, there are lifestyle medicine interest groups. There are students who are aware of the importance of lifestyle and what our patients are eating. Uh, we find the head of the local lifestyle medicine interest group. We go right to her or him. They arrange for Dr. Clapper to come in and to do the lecture or do, do the uh, or, uh, set up the Zoom call. Uh, and we go right to the students. And 
my our and I'm like Johnny Appleseed, just scattering seeds here, and uh, and hopefully enough of them will sprout, because these young students don't stay young students for very long. They become resident, you know, they become interns and then residents and young attending physicians, and then they become the professors. Within five ten years, they go and they go by quick, and we're trying to just um, create a new generation of young physicians with this understanding that it's the food our patients are eating and it becomes obvious to them once you know what you know about you see and uh, and uh, and they again they find the local plant-based dietitian in their area and refer patients to them and or bring them in onto their clinic staff and medicine will become fun for these folks because it's it's dismal. There's so many doctors leaving medicine. You go, all my patients are getting fatter and sicker. Uh, that's right, doctor. You don't talk to them about what they're eating. That's what you're going to see. But it doesn't have to be like that. Get them on a diet nature designed us to eat, and um, and watch your patients get healthy. I'm I'm the happiest doctor I know. I tell them you can be the happiest doctor you know. So that's the story of uh, of uh, moving medicine forward. Um, anybody's interested, our website is movingmedforward.com and you're certainly invited to check out the, the website there. But uh, that's basically the picture in broad brush strokes here. And I'm open to questions about either moving medicine forward or just health and medicine in general. Uh, I love talking about all this stuff. Thank you very much. Thank you. Absolutely. So, um, are there questions? Is there a microphone, or can people come up and talk? Or how do we how do we want to do the questions, John? The microphone is right there. We have a microphone right here. Great. We'll just have people come up and use it if that's okay. Uh, the cord is not long enough to reach to the back of the room. There are no dumb questions, uh, and each one is a teaching opportunity. So don't don't be shy. And uh, uh, everybody will learn here. So uh, the, no question is too basic or too complex. Hey, come on up, come on down. Yeah, I was just wondering about what type of education that you need for to the moving medicine forward. What type of education? It sounds like you need like a medical education of some sort. Right. Um, Fair enough. Um, and yes, uh, the doctors are the linchpin. The doctors are the biggest bottleneck to, for this transition to happen because doctor, we never say anything about the patient's diet. What if every doctor at every visit, even to come in for a sore ear or a sprained wrist, uh, before they let you out, say, by the way, Joe, by the way, Mary, how's your how's your diet going? How's your plant-based diet going? I, I went plant-based a year ago. I'm feeling great. How about you? Would you like to talk to a plant-based dietitian? What if every doctor said that at every visit? It would change everything. And so and, and the doctors are the linchpin. They're the bottleneck that's keeping this transition from happening. And they're the secret sauce that would help this transition to happen. So yes, we are focused with the um, uh, with the uh, on the doctors. But first of all, every health professional is dealing with this. the the dentist, the certainly the nurses, the physiotherapist, the occupational therapist, the pharmacist, they're all dealing with Mr. and Mrs. America with these diet related diseases. So, uh, and, and every health professional should understand these basic principles and be doing it themselves as well. So, um, so uh, uh, we'll, we'll get to the lay public in a minute, but all the other health professionals, absolutely, uh, they need this basic understanding of plant-based nutrition. And it's available if they go to the website of the Plantrition Project, of um, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. Uh, there's dozens of mini courses to people can educate themselves. Wonderful books available uh, now on plant-based nutrition and clinical practice. Uh, I show these slides in my presentation there. Um, so any health professional can and should learn about this uh, till it permeates the whole healthcare system. So that we have plant-based dentists, plant-based pharmacists. Um, and then and then there's the lay public, and uh, and it's a matter of educating the, the you know the, the lay public, and you can certainly 
uh, anyone who's aware of this and doing it themselves and and takes uh, you know takes these basic courses from uh, Dr. Furman, Dr. McDougall, uh, take those courses, educate yourself, and then become a an education center of your, of your own in your local community. Uh, you've got a meeting room there. It's uh, seven thirty in the evening, uh, as you already have. Uh, but for the public, you know, set up, take a table, set up a hot plate and a blender uh, and, uh, and an instant pot and show folks how to make salad dressings and steam vegetables and, uh, and scramble tofu or whatever it is you want to do but, and put the food in their mouths. It's a, a taste is worth a thousand words. And, uh, and uh, just because you don't have a scientific degree after your name doesn't mean you can't be a light in your community to get this uh, uh, get this uh, information out um, because your example speaks volumes and you know, do it yourself you know but get yourself healthier and uh, and and uh, people will will get the message there so it's happening on any level the truth is the truth and it permeates professionals and non-professional lives alike. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Come on up. Or... Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, first was an observation uh, with the advancement of telehealth. Yes. I that they've got a very limited window of time for doctors. And one of the things I've noticed with multiple doctors is after um uh, I've had my meeting with them. I used to not look at the after visit summaries, but I started pulling them up and looking at them. And they'll make statements in there saying, uh, we discussed losing weight and uh, changing the diet. But we never had that conversation during the meetings. And so I'm finding that happening quite a bit with doctor's visits, um, which is very frustrating to me because I know if it's happening to me, it's happening to numerous other people out there as well. Um, second thing is a uh, question for you. I have a brother who is uh, graduated from the Mayo Clinic, who's a doctor, but lives in Meat and Dairy, Wisconsin. And so I'm trying to subtly kind of share information with him. Is there something that you would recommend that would be just a, a great kind of little intro that would maybe draw him into learning more? Um, I, we found uh, in recent years by f far, and thank you for the, those questions, they're, they're really important. And, uh, you know, so often at the beginning of my lectures or at the end, whatever, I wind up apologizing to the audience for my profession. I'm embarrassed by my profession. Uh, and, you know, and they say, uh, discuss diet, and they never do, as you're saying there. And it's dishonest, and it cheats the patient, it cheats the doctor uh, out of a satisfying practice experience. And, it, and it, I get angry, I get embarrassed, and I wind up apologizing. And um, so, yes, I, I certainly hear that first part of the question there. Um, the um, um, so so what how, how do you approach your your brother about this you know I, I think the bible says let those who have ears hear and some people just don't have the ears for it they do not want to hear it for so many levels uh, it, as i said it rocks their uh their everything from their understanding of how the body works to how medicines practice to their um uh, to their income so a lot of them they are and uh, and the uh well we'll get to that in a second um, but if you if they're at all open to this, uh, the best uh, tool so far is to send them a, a DVD or just send them to the website uh, for this wonderful film called Forks Over Knives, and just say, brother, dear doctor, uh, brother, um, would you please just watch this video and then let's have and then let's talk about what you saw. I want you to think about it. And let let here on this video, you see people change their diet, and you watch their bodies transform right before your eyes, and they become leaner and healthier. They get rid of their diabetes. They get rid of their uh, clogged arteries. Um, let your brother watch that film and say, "What do you think? Uh, do you think there's anything there for you?" Uh, and if if he says, "Nah, bah humbug, I don't have time for that." Um, and I don't get paid for it, you know, is is the is is the issue. And there's some, there's truth in that. And many of the doctors will will come up to me afterwards and they say, very nice, doc, but one, I don't know anything about nutrition. 
Second, I don't have time to do this counseling. And third, I don't want to get paid for this. Um, and the answer, of course, is you don't have to, doctor. There are trained professionals. There are plant-based dietitians who are happy to do this counseling for you. You just have to recognize you've got someone sitting in front of you with a diet-based disease, and you just need to make that referral. And, um, and we'll talk about, you know, who pays. It's not thousands of dollars. It's a couple hundred bucks to sit in front of the dietitian. And we got to work, you know, how that, uh, you know, who actually does pay those few dollars. But man, compared to one visit to the ER um, or, you know, a couple of prescriptions for, for uh, Ozempic, uh, one prescription for Ozempic, you, you paid for a lot of dietary uh, counseling at that point. Um, so, um, so I would start with sharing forks over knives. It's so powerful and it's really kind of in, indisputable, uh, uh, conclusions are drawn there. Uh, then that's what I would do. And just say, so what'd you think, you know, and just be open and, and their response will tell you if the door in their mind is open or it isn't there. And if not, then bless them. And maybe they will in a year. Who, who knows? The seed gets planted. You know, you, you can't unring the bell, you know, uh, once you look behind the curtain, you can't pretend you don't know what's behind the curtain. And the fact you see that video, and they saw it, okay? And the seed gets planted. Talk to them six months later, a year later, and see uh, if they're a little more, more open to that message there. So uh, be gentle, but be persistent. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Yes. Sort of, sort of similar in a way. It's not exactly medical profession related, but um, can you hear me okay? Barely, but yeah, speak loudly. I can hear you. No, uh, there's uh, it's mute. Uh, I yeah, you might pull the wire out. I, I don't know. There's no oh, sound. There we go. Okay. Now there is. Okay. okay, good. Great. Okay, thanks. Great. Better. Um, okay, I'll try to make it fast so your arm doesn't get tired. <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> um, I've got two sets of grandchildren. One set is is fully vegan since birth. The other set is in you know meat and dairy land, and um, somehow this the set of parents that are raising the non-vegan children have come up with this. In, to me, crazy um, information that says that vegetables are bad for you because they contain something that fights against your body. So I go to visit them. I prepare these really beautiful vegan meals. The kids love it. They ask for more of what I make for them. I make them tofu and you know broccoli and they, they want more. And then mom says, oh, don't give them too much of that. It might upset their stomach. I'm like, it's good for them. They love it. So I, you know, I I have shared a lot of the information, the movies and things like that, but they're finding their information in other sources. So what what do you do about that? I mean, how do you fight against something like that? Hey, one of the most pernicious, prevalent diseases that permeates our society, I have named <laughs> hyper internet osis. <laughs> and um and those children are suffering from that disease there. It's gotten to the point where uh, the internet's become worse than useless uh, for on so many levels to the undiscriminating um, consumer of information. And, and the words that came out of your lips there are a perfect uh, personification of that. And, um, and so where do you start to unscramble that? Um, in the same way, you can uh, approach regular folks and doctors uh, with that lovely video of forks over knives. Um, and uh, overweight kids are very open to that as well. Uh, but uh, especially for the young folks, uh, vegetables are bad for you. Uh, sh sit them down and show them this wonderful video called The Game Changers. And, uh, and in The Game Changers, they will see these magnificent vegan athletes doing these wonderful feats of endurance and strength and speed, the tennis players, the, uh, the cyclists, the weightlifters. And so the, on vegetables, folks, uh, clearly not very toxic, are they? And um, and the uh, point, I've got a slide on my, my slideshow that, you know, with, I tell them the, the biggest, most powerful animals on the planet, elephants and buffaloes and giraffes and gorillas grow to thousands of pounds of mammalian muscles without eating cheeseburgers. You, you, you do not need uh, to eat the flesh of an animal. You don't need to eat a bull to be as strong as one. And um, and so, you know, let that start to permeate. Oh, that, that's right there. And the, clearly the vegetables are not toxic. Uh, the, the phytates keep you from absorbing 
uh, and, uh, metals and uh, et cetera. That, well, that's ridiculous. The phytates are broken down by cooking uh, and uh, and the, the plant-based eaters are not uh, short of these um, these vitamins and minerals. But um, but very importantly, if they need a clincher, um, the overarching anxiety of the younger generations uh, is climate change. What what's this planet going to be like in twenty years, thirty years? And even that either. And as um, and I make it crystal clear when I'm talking to the young people, I've got a very powerful slide presentation about the effect of large scale industrial agriculture, animal agriculture, how it is the main driving force for every one of the environmental destructive forces that these kids are going to deal with. The deforestation, increasing water pollution, the soil erosion, water uh, depletion. Uh, 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 pick an environmental uh, disaster, pesticides, herbs. They're all from a flesh-based diet. That's why we're cutting down the Amazon. That's why we're cutting down these trees. Uh, we've deforested half the planet uh, already. There used to be six trillion trees on planet Earth. Uh, us white folks have cut down half, three trillion trees in the last 500 years. Uh, and uh, so half the trees are gone. And we're we're not letting those trees come back because we've taken that forest, former forest land, and we're running cattle on it. And we would eat all the young saplings as they start to, to regrow there. And, and that's the ongoing original sin that we not only cut down the forest and burn it, uh, but we, but you know, they, I see these uh, these carbon capture technologies. They're spending billions to try and take carbon dioxide out of the air and sequester. Yeah. When Mother Nature came up with the best carbon capture device ever conceived, they're called trees. They take carbon dioxide out of the air and turn it into solid wood, and and the true the what needs to happen is to cut way back or stop animal agriculture that's going to free up vast amounts of land to let the forest come back and as the trees grow uh they take the carbon dioxide out of the air and turn it into solid wood and they reverse global warming but you can't do it if you've got cows uh, uh grazing the land there and or if you're continually plowing that land and planting feed corn and soybean on it to uh, to shovel down the gullets of hundreds of millions of cows and pigs and chickens, which is what we're doing with that for farmer forest former forest land. And so we have to realize and make it clear every time you go into McDonald's and you buy that burger, you're you're and you put your money down. You go, let's cut down a few more trees. Let's put more carbon dioxide into the air. Let's kill a few more animals here. Let's pollute some more water. What are we doing with our dollars? And I realized that instead of playing victim, I try to make them realize you've got the power. It's in that dollar. Whatever you spend your money on, that's what you're going to get. That's what the companies are going to give you. Well, if you stop buying the meat, it's going to rot in the case here. You, it doesn't cost anything to order the bean chili instead of the beef chili. You know, that's the huge sacrifice we're asking people to make here, you know, and, uh, uh, and get the vegetable curry instead of the chicken curry. Um, it, the the curry is the curry. It's the spices. You know, you're not losing anything by not putting chunks of animal flesh in there. And so, uh, well, I want to tell the one make that connection for the young people that it's that meat based diet. It's the burgers and the chicken and the uh, and the uh, and the fried fish that are that's driving all this environmental destruction. And you can have a role in uh, in stopping it. And uh, and I find I tell the parents that every time you're in the restaurant, especially with your kids, and every time you turn to the wait person and with your orders, oh, I'll have the beef, I'll have the lamb, I'll have the veal, I'll have the chicken. Every time you say those words, your children's world gets a little drier and a little hotter and a little deader. We have to stop kidding ourselves that the, these meats come from the supermarket. They come from your children's future is where this is coming from. So um, 
So it's a matter of uh, of educating through your example. First of all, you got to do it yourself. Um, if people, whoops, sorry about that. Um, if uh, people, you know, it's not to do as I say, not as I do. You got to do it yourself, and then stay open. And when they first hear this message, man, oh, they want to do that. They love their their Big Macs. Um, don't tell me I can't eat that. But then, you know, we there's the truth is a powerful, powerful tool. And uh, you know, most kids don't realize what that burger really is. They're ground up old dairy cows. Um, is uh, after dairy cows, every four or five years, their milk production goes on, they're sent to the slaughterhouse. And the uh, the meat from their carcasses uh, don't doesn't look very... Um, uh, pleasant in the meat case. So it's ground up uh, into ground beef and sold to the fast food industry. And when you buy your Big Mac or your Whopper, you, what you're eating is ground up old dairy cows. It's the end line uh, of the dairy industry. And people say, well, at least, at least when you milk the cow, you don't have to kill the cow. Yes, you do. The dairy industry is a slaughter industry. Uh, the, the dairy barn is a short stopping off place on the way to the slaughterhouse for a few years of calves and milk. Uh, but have no illusion. The dairy industry is a slaughter industry, and then that's what you're eating and fueling when you buy those burgers. And the kids need to know. You tell that to a 14 year old boy, oh, or a girl, oh, I didn't realize that. Maybe it doesn't taste so good anymore. So, um, so speak your truth quietly, but but lovingly, and know know the reality of it. And uh, they won't, their head won't explode. They won't shatter into a million pieces. They won't uh, be, uh, they won't start shooting meth just because you told them what those burgers really are. And, um, and again, such a good example and do the best you can. You know, that's all any of us can do. Thank you. I got a question. I see on your um, Moving Medicine Forward website that you yep. have a master class. Yes. Um, right. Can you tell us a little bit about the master class? Like how long would it take to go through it? And is mm -hmm. it open to anybody? I, I would be interested in um, just educating the public. I'm not in a medical field at all. So would that be something I could do? Right. Um, I, again, when we first started moving medicine forward, I, um, said, you know, again, somebody, we should do a course on applied plant-based nutrition. Somebody's got to put this in the heads of the medical students and the doctors. How do you actually do it? Why does it work? And how do you actually use it in practical terms for people with high blood pressure, people with diabetes, um, people with colitis? Um, why does a plant-based diet help them and how do you institute it in your practice? So we put together courses, 12 lessons, and we go through the major organ systems, uh, obesity, diabetes, clogged arteries, et cetera. And we spend an hour on, on each one. Um, and uh, it's geared up to people who've taken physiology and anatomy and biochemistry. It is for the scientific audience. But I've had many folks not in the, uh, in the scientific community take the course and benefit from it. I believe it's a, it's a 12 unit course, I think it's 200 bucks, it's not 3000. Uh, and the, um, and I think the introductory course is free, the, the first lesson. And and I realized in that first lesson, I I really summarized the whole course in that one talk. So, so see Chep, see lesson number one, uh, and, and I think it's free there, so watch that and you'll get the taste of it. You get the main lessons, and if you want, if you're really excited about delving into the physiology of these various conditions, uh, then you know you. I think you can buy the lessons individually if you just want to learn the autoimmune one or just want to learn the diabetes one. Uh, you can you can buy the individual lessons, and uh, so it is meant for uh, someone with scientific training, but folks without it have apparently have gotten a lot of benefit out of it. Watch the first lesson and see what you think. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay. I'll ask one last question. Really All right, one last question. Um, there are a bunch of plant-based nutrition certifications out there. Mm. I have one particular one in mind, and I'm wondering if you have one that you would recommend above the others. Yeah. Um, Dr. McDougall's course and Dr. Furman's course, I think, are the most straightforward and most practical. Um, 
I found the one from Cornell. It's, it's kind of academic and there's more economics in it, but as far as the nitty gritty, how does the work in the body um, and how does it affect these diseases? Um, I've, Dr. McDougall, Dr. Furman's courses, I think are, are more illustrative there. And so I'd be, be more valuable. Okay, well, good for you guys for being open to this. Thank you for the invitation. Sorry about that initial glitch there, but we got yeah. in a good, good yeah. solid hour here and uh, hopefully got most of your questions answered. So, um, John, when we're through, I will send you a link to download uh, the, the recording here and, and feel free to edit out the, the part there. And uh, and let's stay in touch. If you want to do this again in a few months or a year from now or whatever, I'm, yeah. that, uh, I'm on oh your side. I already know that. Anyway. Okay, you, you know how to reach me. By the way, can you <laughs> see we, what we do is we do a potluck, all vegan meal. Everybody brings a little better. We have that, and then we have the presentation, which is, um, you know, like you just did. And uh, we have this, every month we do this, every month we do a vegan happy hour. Yes. <laughs> and it has been very, very good. Good and, for you. Um, it's a... Uh, Northwest Edge in Portland is an excellent organization, and it is a, uh, a a tribute to what they have done over the years. COVID just knocked everybody for a loop, so we're all trying to come back and see how we can do this and do it better. But um, I I really thank you. This was very very good. Oh. We, Indeed. Well, thank you all. I uh, really appreciate your work. So, um, go ahead, John. Were you going to say something? Yeah, I was going to say two other things. One is, um, I heard that you're now in Vancouver, BC, or is are you still in, in uh, Santa Rosa? No, I've, I've moved up actually to Victoria, British Columbia, the capital city up there. Uh, because there's a lifestyle medicine clinic there um, uh, called Eroga Lifestyle Medicine. And, and, the, and the reason I moved up there is that, one, they've got a different situation in Canada. The, in, in the States, um, medical care is paid for largely by insurance companies who make money off of every operation, off every pill that's dispensed, there's so much money being made up for off the disease model. Up in Canada, the government, the Canadian government's paying all the all the fees here, and they are interested in, in lowering the cost. And um, and as a result, um, the Lifestyle Medicine Clinic uh, has set up a program that when I saw it, I said, "Yes, uh, uh, you see the uh, uh, the the patients are referred in by their family doctor." You see the doctor at the clinic, and the next stop is the plant-based dietitian, just, just like I described before. And the government pays for the dietitian. They know the importance of that. And uh, and it, and they're starting to get wonderful results. Um, because Canada is so big, they do a lot of telemedicine uh, to reach all these distant patients. And I've got a lot of telemedicine experience. So they've hired me as their director of telemedicine services uh, to do the follow-up and to uh, do the teaching there. So it's a, it's really cutting edge medicine that's going to work. And then we can take that model back to the States there. So, um, so I'm up at, um, in Victoria, BC, uh, but I'm still obviously going to be uh, traipsing all around North America. I'm, no matter where on the continent I am, I'm available to everybody and uh, going to be cheering you all on there. A um, couple of other things. Yep. Um, we put out a monthly newsletter to yep. Vancouver, Washington about what's going on. Um, one of the things that we have found is you can't find out a lot of stuff about the United States from within the United States because the meat and dairy industry and every day. Don't so we know. Having to go to other places. And we've been getting a lot of information from plant-based news in out of England. Yes. And um, great group. 
very good. And we found out that Norway just outlawed the factory farm. Yes. And uh, Finland is just about to. So, yes. uh, wonderful. Found out it was great news. Um, and there's, uh, if, if you'd like, I'd be happy to send you a copy of the newsletter. Every month. Please do. Please do. Put me on your list. I want to be a subscriber. Absolutely. And I'll send you articles to consider publishing about what we're doing as well. Okay. Great. Appreciate Great. it. You also, bet. if there's a student in any of the medical schools around Portland that is in your moving medicine forward, We'd like to have a link to that person and maybe be able to use them in presentations. And oh, yes. So, so I've got some names for you. There. Yes. Yeah. And and if you go to my website, movingmedforward.com, there's a page that says, if you know a medical student or a faculty member at any med school who might be open to this message, give us their name and, and contact info. We'll contact them about getting a Dr. Clapper lecture at their school. So, um, yes, yeah, so we're looking for interested folks, but I've got some folks in that area that might uh, might also be of interest to you. It was very interesting for me to go to my doctor who is with Kaiser and then see his uh, uh, forks over knife uh, video on his desk when I was in. Yes, <laughs> that's a positive sign. It's happening slowly. Yeah. It's happening because of the work life of you. And I want to point out that it's you folks. It's the educators in the community that are really going to turn this ocean liner the week of the scientists we've done everything we can do it's it's a matter of educating the public and it's events like this and your daily work that you do in your community that really makes people change and so i really cheer you on for your great work well it's nice because we have a small group we listen to each other well i my whole family's been diabetic for for years but I reversed mine, and uh, you know, hearing those kind of stories, and some of them are just little things, but it's amazing. Um, oh, it's... people find that uh, they're not eating dairy, and all of a sudden they don't have problems with flying anymore, and they, you know, so. Hmm. What a coincidence! Yeah. Exactly. You know, and by the way. Um, feel free to, to magnify your megaphone there. Um, this is getting to be interesting stuff for the public and the news media. To call your local channel for news or whatever. And so would you guys like to attend a meeting or do, are you aware that uh, we have uh, plant-based classes and meetings and uh, uh, you may find an interest that they may send a reporter to one of your meetings and uh, or do a little article on you guys and a lot of people are going to see that. So oh take God. some oh, yeah, amplify, yeah, amplify your platform there. I wish you well on that. And then we've always known that uh, somebody from out of town is always the expert. So uh, <laughs> it, it, you go someplace else, and then they want you to talk because, well, you, you've done this and you've done that, and so yeah, it's interesting. Um, so we're always looking to capitalize on any kind great. of thing. Great. Great. You see, so yeah. Anyway, okay. Very, very good presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you're so welcome. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Up your great work. With it too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. Good night, everybody. All right. Good night. Okay. Bye. Good night.